Good morning again. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 1. And if you've looked at the sermon details in your, in your bulletin, you already know that we're aiming to cover seven chapters in Leviticus in one sitting right now. But you may be wondering why. Why these seven chapters? Why not one or two or five? Why not just a, a few verses? Well, our goal in this series is not to teach Leviticus exhaustively. It's to learn to study it for ourselves. That's one reason. Last week I said that there's three principles boiled down to three words that will guide our thinking through Leviticus. Relationship, rebellion, and reconciliation. God desires relationship with the people He made. We broke that fellowship with God by our rebellion and sin. And Jesus reconciles us to God by His atoning work of dying in our place. That atoning work is promised all the way back in Genesis at the very beginning of the Bible. And it's foreshadowed in tremendous detail in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus begins with Moses standing outside a tent in the wilderness. We covered the backstory last week. God made a promise to send a Redeemer who would deal with the sin problem. God called Abraham to establish a nation. The purpose of that nation was to provide the heritage of the Messiah and foreshadow His work. That's the purpose of of Israel, this nation moving out in the Exodus through the Sinai wilderness, this group of people that's with Moses. That nation, the Jewish people, by their sin and rebellion were slaves in Egypt. Slaves in a land of sin and death. But God says, it's time. I'm rescuing you. I'm bringing you into the land of promise. And as a symbol of faith in God, they apply the blood of a lamb to the doorposts of their homes. And they're set free from sin and death. That detail is crucial. Before Leviticus, they're already redeemed. They're already out of the land of sin and death. By the blood of a lamb, they're free people set apart for God. That's an image of God's saving work through the Messiah. But after 400 years in Egypt, they lived and thought like Egyptians. They adopted the habits of their culture. God got them out of Egypt, but before they can have real fellowship with God, He needs to get the Egypt out of them. He saved them. And he's bringing them home into a land of promise. But they aren't there yet. And they need to learn how to live as the people of God who are distinct in their worship of a God who's distinct in His holiness. You see the parallels, right? We trust in the Messiah. We're saved. We're set free from sin and death. And now, by His Spirit indwelling us, God is with us in the wilderness of our lives, teaching us how to live as His people as we move closer and closer to our home with Him forever. Egypt is sin and death. Sinai is the wilderness of life. The promised land is our home with God forever. Leviticus is God giving Moses instructions for how people can enjoy fellowship with God. It teaches them to trust in the holiness that God would provide for them through the Messiah promised to them. That's the purpose of the book. Teaching people to trust in the holiness God would provide for them through the Messiah promised to them. Okay, That's all review. That's what we studied last week. If you weren't here last week, or you missed it, or you slept through it, you're now up to speed. But why these seven chapters? Because Leviticus 1.1 begins with God talking. And then God talks for seven chapters about one subject, 
which gets summarized in what Frank read at the beginning of the service. Leviticus 7, 37 through 38. This is the law of the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the consecrations and the sacrifice of the peace offering, which the Lord commanded Moses on Mount Sinai on the day when he commanded the children of Israel to offer their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. Cindy loves puzzles. She'll get out a thousand piece puzzle and just dump it on a table. And at first, to me, it's just chaos, absolute chaos. The individual pieces are just chaos. They're everywhere, and there's no way to make sense of them to me. But then she'll start organizing them by color. And she'll connect all the border pieces of a certain color. And then she'll connect those sections to the other sections. And soon, the whole picture comes together. And it's something beautiful that couldn't be seen by looking at any of the individual pieces. I think Leviticus is a lot like that. Rather than chapters, we should take it in thematic chunks. Big chunks of text grouped together in the same way she would group those puzzle pieces by color. Big chunks of text grouped around a common theme. For example, we should group all the things said about the sacrificial system together. And similarly, we should group all the things said about the priests into one category. There's a reason this summary in chapter 7 is there. And I'll get to this graphic here in just a second. There's a reason that summary in chapter 7 is given. Leviticus itself is leading us to consider the whole sacrificial system as one unit. That it communicates together one thing. So we'll take our cues from the text and not the chapter breaks that the editors added over the years. And when we do that, we'll be able to see how each section works in light of the whole book, and we'll be able to see how each little detail within each section contributes to that section and connects, connects to the others. There's other ways to organize this. Some are good, some are bad. But I think if we continue with that puzzle analogy, if you were to do a puzzle, you would look at the lid of the box and you would see what it's supposed to look like. If we took the lid off the box and looked at the picture of what Leviticus is supposed to be, we would see a structure that looks something like this. Leviticus has bookends. It begins and ends with matching sections on remembrance. Chapters 1 through 7 deal with the people remembering God's provision and salvation through sacrifice. This is where we learn about the burnt offering and the grain offering and things like that. That's what we'll examine this morning. Towards the end of the book, there's, there's a corresponding section on remembrance, chapters 23 through 25. But this time, it's about remembering God's provision and salvation, not through sacrifice, but through celebration. That's where we see the feast days and the festivals. Now, this symmetry is repeated all through the book. In chapters 8 through 10... We see that these priests are called to serve in the tabernacle. It describes their work. And then in chapters 21 through 23, we read of their qualifications. You see this matched pair. We see the priests called, and then later we see the priests qualified. It's a matched pair about priests. In chapters 11 through 15, we have a section on ritual purity. Then in 17 through 20, we have a section on moral purity. By building in habits of ritual purity, the people would naturally avoid a lot of moral pitfalls. In that, they would also learn to be distinct from the Canaanites and Egyptians in their living so that they would likewise be distinct in their worship. And then that leaves chapter 16 as something of a standalone. It doesn't have a matched pair. 
There's no complimentary bookend. But I don't think that's by accident. This seems to be the central theme of the book. Once a year, the high priest, this is chapter 16, once a year the high priest would enter the most holy place. That was the innermost part of this tent. So the innermost part of the book deals with the innermost part of the tent. There, the glory of God was so intense that only the high priest could enter, and that only once a year for a special ceremony on the Day of Atonement. In that ceremony, one goat would be offered and sacrificed for the sin of the people, and another goat would be cast out into the wilderness. It's a powerful image of substitutionary atonement. The two goats paint one picture. The sin of humanity is laid on Jesus who dies in our place. He pays the price for our redemption. He then removes the presence of sin from our lives. One goat dies, the second is cast out. That's the image here. And that's not merely my take on it. The author of Hebrews interprets the Day of Atonement the same way. Hebrews 9, 24 through 26. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. Let's go back to that graphic one more time. The central thought of the book of Leviticus is the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. That's how the book's structured. And every matched pair points the reader closer and closer to that central theme. So as we take it in chunks, as we group the puzzle pieces together according to their categories, understand the image they form is pointing us to Jesus. We'll start with the sacrificial system in chapters 1 through 7. There are five sacrifices spread out over seven chapters. And each one of the five gives more detail about the work of Jesus. As a whole, the sacrificial system paints a vivid image for the Sinai generation. That's the first principle I want us to see this morning. The sacrificial system as a whole paints a vivid image for the Sinai generation. Like I said, there's five sacrifices prescribed in Leviticus 1 through 7. First is something called the burnt offering. Now, it may help in your thinking to call this the whole offering because all of them get burned. There's one that's called the burnt offering, but all of them get burned. This one's unique in that all of it gets burned, the whole thing. So you can call it the burnt offering, you can call it the whole offering just to help keep it straight because all of it gets burned. Look at Leviticus 1, 3 through 4 with me. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will. At the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Later, it goes on to outline very similar procedures for animals that weren't bulls. Goats, sheep, even certain birds were acceptable, which just goes to show that it's not about the animal. It's about the heart of the one making the offering. And that's ingrained into the passage we just read. You might underline this phrase. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. 
the first offering upon which the rest are predicated was always voluntary. Always. It's not about salvation. It's about the heart of the worshiper. There at the door, before coming into the presence of God, the worshiper would make his offering and it would serve as a reminder that sin has a terrible cost and that God would pay the price through the atoning sacrifice of the Messiah to come. This was an individual thing. The offerer would bring a bull or a sheep or a bird. Whichever of those was the best he could offer, or she. And then he would lean his weight into the head of that animal. This placing the hands on the head, it's not just like, I touch it. He's like leaning into it. He's symbolically transferring his life, his guilt into that animal that was to die. It was a symbol that fellowship with God is by the atoning sacrifice of the Messiah who would die in our place. This transferring of guilt, this animal is dying in place of the one offering it. The offerer would then kill his offering and the whole thing in its entirety would be burned. Its smoke would ascend up into heaven as a pleasing aroma. But what would that smell like? It, it would smell like barbecue. It's, it's a bull or a sheep being cooked over a fire. It would smell really good. By our trusting in the death of a perfect lamb, the perfect lamb that God would provide. God is pleased with us as we stand in his presence. That's the first offering in the sacrificial system of Leviticus. It's the burnt offering or the whole offering. Then in chapter 2, there's the grain offering. Leviticus 2, 1 through 3. When anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, one of whom shall take it from his handful of fine flour and oil with all the frankincense, and the priests shall burn it as a memorial on the altar." an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his son's. It is most holy of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. Oil, spices, and finely ground flour without leaven. It's specifically called a memorial in what we just read. That's this idea of Remembrance, that's what a memorial's for. It's to help us remember. Now, the, the grain offering, it could be raw ingredients like we just read, but it goes on to say that it could be cooked or baked as long as it didn't have leaven or honey in it. Why not honey? We have you ever burned honey? Not a pleasing aroma. Whether it was raw or baked, if it was baked or cooked, the loaf would be broken in this offering. But where the burnt offering was a reminder that salvation came from God, the grain offering was a reminder that even our daily provision comes from God. By making this offering, the offerer would communicate his thanks and trust in God for daily bread. He would also communicate his desire to partner with God in advancing God's kingdom. You see, the priests, Aaron's sons, they didn't receive an allotment of land. They couldn't grow grain. They couldn't raise animals or crops. Instead, their labor was administering the things we read about in Leviticus. And so by giving this offering, the offerer would be choosing to ensure that the priests were fed and in doing so, the offerer was committing his work 
to the purposes of God. That's two out of five. Third, we read of something called the peace offering in chapter 3. This was similar to the grain offering, but expanded. If they wanted to eat meat, two things had to happen. One, they had to give a certain portion to the Lord and certain cuts of meat to the priests. Two, they had to rightly appropriate the value of life by carefully dealing with blood and entrails. This is the only way they're allowed to eat meat as part of this set-apart people of God. If they are going to slaughter an animal, the offering has to happen. But here's the thing. The offerer got to eat a portion of what was cooked in the peace offering. He got to share it with others, too. It's a peace offering in that it's a shared meal. It's a barbecue with friends. God and man and fellow man symbolically share a meal in the peace offering. And a key detail here is the peace offering was offered with the burnt offering. Okay, we have the burnt offering. That's the whole offering, symbolic of the atonement. The peace offering, where there's this portion that's burned and rises up as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, it's, that portion is set on top of the offering symbolic of atonement. Leviticus 3.5 And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is on the wood, that is on the fire, as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Seeing as the peace offering was offered with the burnt offering, it seems to have functioned as a symbol that through the Messiah, the people of God could enjoy. Why enjoy? I get to eat it. I get to share in the meal. Through the Messiah, the people could enjoy life and salvation with God and fellow man. Let me say that again. The peace offering teaches them that the people could enjoy life and salvation with God and fellow man. Fourth, we see the sin offering. And I want to maybe like draw a line there. Because the first three say thank you to God. The next two say sorry. We see it explained in chapters 4 through 5, the sin offering. It refers to unintentional or procedural violations of the ceremonial law. Not rebellious disregard, but something like accidentally getting the order wrong in the offering. In such cases, different things were offered in different ways to say sorry. Leviticus 4.3 says, If the anointed priest sins bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. But then in Leviticus 4, 27 through 28, it says, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge... Then he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he has committed. So the, the priest who's guilty of unintentional sin offers a bull which costs more than a kid of a goat. The principle here seems to be that with closer proximity to the tabernacle comes higher expectations of holiness. The closer proximity to the tabernacle brings higher expectations of holiness. More was expected of the high priest. In fact, his unintentional sin is said to have brought guilt on everyone. But this is one more reason to remember that Leviticus is not about salvation. How, how could it be if 
The offering was different for the salvation of a priest and a common person. I mean, the same is true today. We read all through it in the New Testament. The standards for pastors and leaders in the church are higher. But the price of our redemption is the same. Still, this sacrifice was a way in which the offerer would communicate to God that he was sorry even for the unintentional ways in which he didn't honor the Lord. This is a prescription for maintaining a close relationship with the Lord. It communicates that the people couldn't take fellowship with God for granted. The animal would be killed in the camp and then burned outside of it. Once again, this symbol of sin being removed from their lives. So we've covered four out of five. One more. It's called the trespass offering. It's also called the guilt offering, but it's the same thing. It's very similar to the sin offering in that it it, it communicates that the offerer is sorry. But this goes beyond saying sorry to God for unintentional violations of the ceremonial law. It's an offering that says sorry to God and to other people in case we wrong them in case these people would have wronged other people by their sin. First, the wrong was made right, if possible. Damages were repaid plus 20%. If, if If we were all living in this culture, if how I wronged you cost you the value of a bull, I would give you a bull, and then I'd give you 20% of the value of a bull on top of it to say I'm sorry. And then... I would go to the tabernacle and make a sacrificial offering because my sin also, while it damages my relationship with you, it also damages my relationship with God and I've got to get right there too. Leviticus 6, second part of verse 5 and verse 6. He shall restore its full value, add one-fifth more to it, and give it to him whoever it belongs on the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord, a ram without blemish from the flock, with your valuation as a trespass offering to the priests. So five offerings for five different purposes with a lot of commonality. The offerer always offered his best. It was never okay to offer the lame, the sick, like that old, rotting, clumpy flower. It was never okay to offer that which cost nothing and didn't affect the bottom line. Unblemished animals, fine flour, choice cuts of meat. It was always a sacrifice. No matter where a person was on the economic ladder. The picture here is that sin is costly. God would offer His best to reconcile us to Him, and the people were to remember that by offering their best to God. Second, there was always a careful handling of blood. It it. It bothers me to no end when I hear people preach on Leviticus and they just describe this bloody, gory mess. Read it. They're very, very orderly and careful with the entire thing. Always. The side of the altar that it gets sprinkled on is prescribed in fine detail. Why? Because this will be a people that values life. It's not to be something they take lightly. They're going to be different than the Egyptians and the Canaanites. This nation would not be a nation that disregarded the value of life. There was always a picture of fellowship with God and others in these images of substitution. Something, an animal or grain was offered in place of another. There's always this picture of a substitute. 
And then finally, another commonality, every offering was in some way administered by one of the Levites. Someone who wasn't guilty of the sin was involved in working out this symbolic reconciliation that's pictured in the sacrificial system. There was always a mediator. Always. This whole thing paints a picture that reminded the people of God's provision and salvation through the promised Messiah. Who's not only the sacrifice but the mediator as well. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves this morning. So, that's the sacrificial system. Why did none of you bring your animals to church this morning? Why did nobody bleed their goat at the doorstep and then come in? Why am I not here sprinkling blood? Because while it's true that the sacrificial system paints a vivid image, this vivid image is a shadow that points to and precedes the substance. Yes, Leviticus paints a vivid image for the Sinai generation, but it's a vivid image that's a shadow, and that shadow points to and precedes a substance. It's an image of something, a reflection. It's not the thing itself. In Christ, we have the substance and therefore have no need for the shadow. Animal sacrifices are a shadow. Christ is the substance. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says that plainly. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4 is also explicitly clear. The sacrifices of Leviticus do not save. They are, they are a picture of what Christ would do to save us, and they are a reminder for us to trust in Him. It says this, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Okay, pause. Can the Levitical sacrifices make perfect those who approach God? Never. Did it ever do that? Never. How many people were saved by sacrificial animals outside a tent in the Sinai wilderness? Zero. Verse 2. For then they would not have ceased to be offered. Right? If there were any actual salvation in them, they'd keep going. But they ceased to be offered. Why? For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. So that's its function, to remind. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It's a reminder. It's to remember what Christ would do. Remember is a word that we typically think of as looking back in remembrance. And for us, we do look back. But the Sinai generation remembered a promise and looked forward. You know, it's interesting. We can read in Exodus very detailed plans for the tabernacle. We know what it was built out of and how big it was. We know what furniture was in it and how the furniture was arranged. But in all that detail, perhaps you notice something that isn't mentioned. In the tabernacle, there are no chairs. No sitting down. No rest. Continual sacrifices being made. Blood being spilled. The grim reminder of sin and its terrible cost constantly. But then in Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, it says, And every priest stands 
ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, that's Jesus, waiting till his enemies are made a footstool, for by one offering he is perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Why do we not bring sacrificial animals to church? Because Christ is the offering. He is the Lamb. He's the one sacrifice for sin forever. He alone is enough to reconcile us to God, to make us brothers and sisters in God's kingdom, and allow us to enjoy our reconciled relationship with God and our healed relationships with each other. He's enough for all of it. Amen? Praise the Lord. By His sacrifice on the cross, our lives can be a pleasing aroma to God. Now, if I can borrow from my puzzle metaphor one more time. Imagine you just put that thousand-piece puzzle together, and it's this beautiful landscape. You grouped all the pieces together. You know how each piece fits with the others. You, you see this beautiful image now. As great as that image is, as wonderful as that picture might be, does it compare to actually being there yourself? Does it compare to actually standing in the spot where the photograph was taken? Does it? No way. I've seen pictures of the Grand Canyon. And I've stood at the edge. I've been there in person. Let me tell you, the size and scale and grandeur of reality can never be captured by a picture. When we trust in Christ, we enter into the reality of the picture that the sacrificial system only paints. Let me say that again. When we trust in Christ, we enter into the reality of the picture that the sacrificial system only paints. Jesus is the real thing that Leviticus paints an image of. Jesus Christ is the atoning lamb of the burnt offering. He gave himself entirely. Remember I said it's a whole offering. He gave himself entirely. Remember I said it's offered willingly. It's offered out of our free will. Jesus gave himself willingly. No one took his life from him. He laid it down as an offering. Jesus Christ is the grain offering. He's the bread of life. He was broken for you. And for me. And he feeds us. And he meets our greatest needs. He alone is unleavened and without sin. He's the peace offering that allows us to enjoy fellowship with God and each other. He pays the price for our sin. He's the offering for our guilt and trespasses. Our iniquity was laid upon him. Now, there are those who would advocate, there are those today who would advocate for our following the Levitical system. They're out there. It's actually becoming more popular for some reason. Most of them are well-meaning. Well All of them are wrong. I, no bones about it. Most of them are well-meaning. All of them are wrong. Not only was this system planned to become obsolete from the beginning. Like, it, it's planned to become obsolete from the beginning. We, we read that in Hebrews. It's a copy. It's a shadow. The real thing has come and made it obsolete. It's planned to become obsolete. One. Two, it's impossible 
to do any of it today. Hear me in that. It's impossible to do any of this today. Without the tabernacle slash temple, without the priesthood, you can't do any of it. And to try is to rob Jesus of his glory. It's to prefer shadow over substance. It's to, pre to prefer your little view on your table of the puzzle pieces you put together instead of standing at the edge of grandeur and seeing the reality. It's actually worse than that, I suppose. It's to prefer a shadow of a shadow. Right? You, you can't even, because you can't do it, you can't even have the picture anymore. At best, Leviticus, the, the sacrificial system, was a picture of what Christ would do in reality. But without the temple, without the tabernacle, without the priesthood, you can't even have the picture. It's like you have a picture of, on your phone of a puzzle that was built instead of the actual thing. All you can have is vague images of things that on their best days were shadows. I think we can do better than that. Instead, trust Christ. This is a reminder, all these things in Leviticus, it's all a reminder of the promises of the Messiah anyway. In Christ, we have the real deal. So don't settle for an ancient replica. Still, there is a sacrificial system in place for Christians now. Not this one. Don't bring animals to church, okay? Don't go and kill your f f first bull in the... Don't, don't do it. But there is a sacrificial system in place for Christians now. Christ is the substance of this picture. But there, there are elements of this picture that we see in Leviticus that are offered in substance by believers today. Here's one. Like the burnt offering that was offered in full, all of it being consumed, in Christ we offer our whole lives to the Lord. Unfractioned, unportioned, we offer all of ourselves to who Jesus is. Our undivided hearts. All of our allegiance is to Him. We don't worship by offering dying animals. We worship by offering our real lives. Romans 12.1 I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I told you last week that by understanding Leviticus, it'll make the New Testament seem like you're seeing it with new eyes, right? It goes from being in black and white to being in color. Romans 12, we read that a billion times, but read it in light of the sacrificial system and it, offer your life. I, I still offer a burnt offering, a whole offering, but instead of an animal dying in my place, I live with my whole heart to the glory of God. We don't give a portion of our flour to be burned either. We don't just give a little corner of our bread. We offer all of our work to the Lord. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. In Hebrews 13, 10 through 16, there's a direct link to the sin offering of Leviticus 
and our lives as believers today. I mean, it's directly linked. It spells out what the sacrifices look like for Christians today in contrast to what it looked like in the shadows of Leviticus. It says this, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. And I want to, I want to hit pause there for just a second. Understand what the author of Hebrews is pointing out. You have the Aaronic priesthood. You have the, the priests in Leviticus. And that's how they ate. And it says, hey, this real thing, this is so much bigger and so much better. Those guys don't have a right to eat it. Even though in Leviticus, it specifically says that's how they eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. That's the sin offering. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So specifically, the sacrifices of our life in Christ, this greater sacrifice than anything Leviticus could spell out, from this passage alone is three specific things. One, there's this sacrifice of living in a world that never feels like home. As a believer, do you ever feel like you're just living in a world and you, you just, you, the values of the culture, you just, you just, you're, you're just like you're an alien. You just can't get on board. Living life in a world that never feels like home to the glory of God, instead of just checking out entirely, is a sacrifice in which the Lord is well pleased. In Christ, we live as distinct people, often very different than our culture. Because we, off, we, we worship a God who's distinct in His holiness. And so we're distinct in our worship. Second, in this passage, there's this sacrifice of praise specifically mentioned here. Our offering is worship. The fruit of our lips. Declaring who the Lord is. This, making the gathering of ourselves for corporate worship a priority, rather than sleeping in on Daylight Savings Day. It's a sacrifice. Singing praises to God from the heart, rather than just mouthing the words. It's a sacrifice. One in which He's pleased. Third, doing good. Don't forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So sharing what we have, being generous, loving like Jesus, these are the sacrifices for believers today in which God is pleased. Remember, though, none of this is about salvation. This is how to live in joyful fellowship with the God who's already saved us. The sacrificial system was designed to teach the Hebrew people to remember God's provision and salvation in the promised Messiah. It was a shadow of what Christ would do. We live in the reality of Christ's once and for all sacrifice, not in the shadow. He came he offered His perfect life in our place. He was broken for our sin and for our reconciliation to God the Father from our salvation in Christ by the free gift of God's grace. We offer our lives wholly to Him in worship. 
in Christ, through His perfect sacrifice, the God of the universe is pleased in us. So by way of application this morning, understand the price Jesus paid for your redemption. Think of all five of these sacrifices as one cohesive image of what Christ purchased for you at the cross. I mean, sometimes we make the gospel too small. If that were possible. Right? The reality of our sin being paid for in the death of Christ is vast and measureless. Yet, Somehow, we still make it too small. Because what Christ has done is even more than that. Before He died the death we deserve, He lived the life we never could. He was perfect in every way. He is perfection offered in place of the guilty. And his life and death accomplished more than our forgiveness. We stand before God not as people whose sentence has already been served. We stand before God as if we had lived perfect lives ourselves. But that's only through Christ. Through Jesus, we are beloved sons and daughters by whom God is well pleased. Christ offered all of himself for you and me to redeem us and to sanctify us. Apart from him, we're condemned. We're slaves to sin and death. But he frees us and He washes us, and He makes us new. And so the only rational response is that we offer our whole lives to Him in worship. That's the second point of application I want you to see. Offer your whole life to Him in worship. We looked at Romans 12.1 earlier. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Christ did the dying it's a pretty good deal, right? We get to live because he died already. The only rational response is to offer our lives to him in worship. We get to live. But real life is lived in worship to the only one who's worthy. Offer your whole life to him in worship. It's rational, it's reasonable. And he is worthy.